and welcome to the talk I wish existed three months ago. Why three months ago? Well, let me run you through a little story. I've known about functional programming for about three or four years. I have experience with Haskell and F Sharp, and I've dabbled in other languages such as PureScript. But I had a, pro a project coming up about uh, three months ago that I wanted to use functional programming for. I thought it was a great project, and I thought, let's dive into it. The thing is, it was a TypeScript project, and I had no experience with that writing functional code in JavaScript or TypeScript. And let me say, the learning experience wasn't great, and I wish this talk had existed three months ago to give me a helping hand. Uh, first, a little bit about me. My name is Frederick Fogarty. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Imagex, uh, and there I have the, the fortunate role of overseeing a lot of uh, SDKs, a lot of different languages, a lot of different projects written in different languages and frameworks. And so I have a pretty good view of the land. Um, they're based in San Francisco. Right now, I'm in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, next time we, we have this, this conference that I can uh, make the trip to London and uh, give it to you in person. Uh, and so my promise to you by the end of these 30 minutes is that if you're someone who doesn't really know what functional programming is, you're going to have a good understanding um, of what it is and why it's important. And if you're looking to actually dive in and write some uh, functional code in TypeScript with the library FPTS, uh, then you'll have a better understanding of how to write actual functional code, not just what a monad is. All right. So in this talk, I'm first going to briefly go over uh, what FP and FPTS, FPTS are, uh, their kind of benefits and why you should use uh, this functional programming paradigm that is so popular and gaining popularity uh, every day, it seems, and also uh, what the pros and cons are of uh, using FPTS specifically. Um, and then the second section, I'll be going over uh, an app refactoring. And with this, I'll be taking an existing application in JavaScript and converting it to a functional style. And hopefully with this, uh, this is for the people who want to write actual FPTS code, uh, you can have a deeper understanding of how to reason about uh, functional code, not just read an example and try copy that example. All right, so functional programming. First, what is it? Well, the analogy I like to use is that uh, to explain to people who have written JavaScript already and have tried TypeScript, that uh, when you go from JavaScript to TypeScript, you're essentially adding data contracts to your code base. So what you're saying is, this function returns this data, and this function consumes that data, and the type system can help you ensure those contracts are compatible. And then if you change a contract, the type system will help you out and say, hey, look, you should probably change this other thing as well to make sure the data flows around your system correctly. For me, uh, one of the benefits of uh, functional programming is now we extend this contract to not just include the data, but the behavior and how that affects your application. What that means is, uh, instead of just saying this function returns this data, now we're saying this function behaves in this way. This function can throw an error, it can maybe return a value, these kinds of things is asynchronous. And then this, when this other function consumes it, the type system will help us ensure that those function contracts are compatible. Some of the benefits of functional programming is that uh, you end up with code which is more isolated and testable. And why this matters is because when you're writing OOP, uh, a common thing is you kind of have to uh, force yourself to write good isolated testable code uh, with dependency injection and things like this. And it can seem like you're just pushing a ball up to the top of a hill and it's kind of teetering it up there. And then at any moment, it can kind of just roll off. What's uh, a term that is thrown around a lot in the industry is a pit of success. And functional programming is commonly seen as one of many pits of successes. Basically, by writing your code in a functional style using a functional framework like FPTS, you don't really have to do much effort to make your ball roll down into the pit, and you have a, a, more, uh, a better program as a result, and you don't really have to do too much work for it. 
It turns out that with functional programming, I like to think of there being three pits of success. There's isolation, correctness, and testability. In this talk, I'm gonna be uh, giving you an understanding of why, of how the kind of correctness uh, pit of success is relevant, but for other pits of successes, what I recommend you do is go watch this talk by Mark Seaman uh, called The Pits of Success. Uh, he has some great explanations in there and you can see it's an hour long. It's uh, well worth the time. And also any of his other uh, talks are also amazing. Seriously, go watch them, they're great. Now a bit about FPTS. It's a, uh, a TypeScript library which has 5K styles on GitHub and it's the biggest functional programming library that implements Haskell-esque uh, types. This is not like Ramda or Lodash. This is implementing uh, types like ethers and task ethers. And don't worry if that means nothing to you yet. Hopefully it will by the end of this talk. Kind of leading on from before, I like to think of functional programming having the benefits with things that can fail. Uh, and also it helps you write this code because it's replacing, it's kind of built from real world code. It wasn't just made up kind of theoretically. These two things allow uh, you to have a much better experience when you're refactoring your code. Because if you can uh, have these contracts, these behavior contracts, and also the fact you're running less code means that when you're refactoring, you have less stuff to check that is correct. And also the type system helps you uh, ensure that the stuff you are moving around uh, is working together behaviorally. So if you move a function underneath another function, which throws in, which returns an error state, you have to handle that. And a uh, functional programming paradigm forces you to do this, but it doesn't, it doesn't make it complicated. Don't worry about that. Uh, it also helps uh, with validation, uh, isolation and testing. It makes functions more testable. Uh, a downside for me is that TypeScript wasn't really made for functional programming. Uh, I'm not to say that they're not doing the best job they can, but when you have a language which is designed for functional programming like Haskell, the benefits are gonna be much more significant than in a language like JavaScript where you're kind of just uh, putting it in there. It wasn't designed for it, but I still think there are benefits to be had. Um, and what I think is that if you do like functional programming when you try this out in JavaScript, I would suggest to you to uh, try out another language um, like PureScript or Haskell briefly and see if it's worth making the complete switch. Obviously it's a bigger investment, but I like that you can try out functional programming in JavaScript with no real cost. And for me, the biggest, the biggest downside is your QA team might not have any work to do. You're gonna write less bugs and then your project manager is gonna come along and say, hey, give me some bugs so I can give it to the QA team in there and uh, they, can, they can review them and fix them. Um, and they're not gonna have any work to do because functional programming is gonna force you to write more correct code. We've briefly gone through what functional programming is and what FPTS is and its pros and cons. And I wanna slow down a bit and take you through the main part of the talk, which is talking about our application. Uh, this is a real world example. It's not a to-do list or just a simple like theoretical example. I think this example combines enough complexity with database calls, asynchronous work and business logic to give you a, a understanding of what writing actual functional code uh, is like in, in TypeScript. So let's dive in. What our application is gonna do is it's gonna be an airline reservation manager and it's gonna handle uh, reservation requests from the client. So the client will pass a reservation request to the server. The server will validate this uh, JSON request essentially and will return a 422 if it's invalid. If it is valid, it will try and accept this reservation which means that it has to go to the database, get the existing reservations for that flight. If there's enough capacity on the plane, uh, it will save the reservation and return a 201. Otherwise, if there's not enough capacity, it will return a 403. What that looks like in code is, this: you can imagine this code's running in a sort of functional um, server uh, on, on, a, on a server somewhere on a Node.js server. And this is the first line, this is the function contract. And what I want to point out here is the promise, uh, the return type. So we're returning a promise and inside this promise we have an HTTP response. But the thing is, we all know promises can be rejected, but we don't express this in our type system. So 
we have no way of knowing when we consume this function uh, whether it's going to fail or not. Maybe we read the documentation and we make a best guess um, when we're writing code that's consuming this function or consuming any promise and we code it kind of with this assumption uh, when we write it. But then down the track, um, or even because the documentation's incorrect, uh, this promise could reject and we could end up with a function that errors at runtime because we just haven't considered all cases because we there's been some issue along the way. Now, I think you have, kind of have two ways to solve this. One uh, is that you can write code defensively so you end up uh, with just try catches or dot catches everywhere on your application. And uh, this just leads to kind of wasted code for things that you know can't fail. And the second way is you kind of just trust it and hope for the best and add like a catch all uh, in the, the top level of your application. But I think um, this is kind of a little bit of a cop out because you can do much better if you can handle uh, the errors where they happen and if you know where they happen and you can do this easily. We're going to find out how we can do this with functional programming. So first thing we do, we validate the uh, request that came in. And if it's not valid, we return a 422. If it's valid, we try and accept that reservation uh, by sending it to this try accept method uh, in the reservation manager. And then uh, this function is going to return either undefined or a reservation. Undefined if it fails, if there's no capacity. And so we handle that undefined by returning a 403. Otherwise, we return a 201 to say that the uh, creation succeeded, the reservation was saved successfully. Now let's dive into the try accept method. Um, this is where a, a lot more happens. So here we're uh, saying that we're taking a reservation request and we're returning a promise. I want to look at the function contract here again, because now we've kind of indicated that this function can error, but we're representing this as an undefined type. And that, to me, this seems like a bit of a hack. To me, it seems like we could lean on the type system a little bit better to help us along and indicate this is actually an error, and an error state. Maybe you think of returning an error type instead, but then the consuming code gets messy, it has to check instance solve and things like this. It's not the best. We can do better than this. But for now, let's look at this function. So first, we uh, get the reserved seats for that flight from the database. Then we check if there's capacity. If not, we return undefined, as I've mentioned. And if the capacity is sufficient, we can create a reservation. Cool, so that's a first look through the uh, promise-based code. Um, and I want to draw uh, attention to an aspect of this code that can be improved um, with a library uh, that comes with FPTS. I could do a great, I could, I could go through and, and talk through this, but I thought I'd leave it best to an existing talk by Robin Picorni, who explains this concept extremely well uh, in seven minutes, validation. And honestly, you should go check it out. It's awesome. Um, yeah, it's type functional programming and TypeScript with FPTS. Back to the promise based code. So, you're probably wondering, Fred, why did you uh, write prom what, write uh, the code in a promise-based style? Well, I was thinking for a long time about the best way to create this uh, deep mapping, uh, intuitive mapping between code you already know and are familiar with, promises, and functional programming. Because I believe with this mapping, then you can go and be more empowered to write functional code yourself with a better, deeper understanding of it. And sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards. So how I'm going to relate this promises to functional programming is you can think of promises as being a framework. When you write normal code, you kind of say, OK, let's pass the data around. And you pass the data around yourself manually. Then when you use promises, instead of passing the data around yourself, you just tell promise promises what to do when data exists. So you say, uh, you, you call these dot then calls, and then you just trust promises, the promise framework to pass the data around for you. Uh, and then if an error happens, you trust the promise to handle that error and 
uh, execute either the next dot catch callback you've registered or just reject that whole promise. So to illustrate this in code and how this maps to func a functional style with FPTS, I've taken the code for the try accept method you've already seen and just reduce it down to the promise backbone. What we can see here is we're uh, getting the reserved seats again, and then we're chaining this dot me dot then message uh, callback onto that promise. And the same code written in functional style actually looks quite similar. On the right, we had the same code written in a functional style. Uh, it's probably a lot to take in uh, at first, but let's dive through it uh, piece by piece. So first, we're going to look at the return types. On the left, we return a promise as normal. And on the right, we're returning this thing called a task either. This is something FPTS provides for us, and you import it uh, like so. And what a task either is, is it's a combination of a task and an either. A task you can think of as a promise, some asynchronous code that never fails, always succeeds. And you can think of an either representing either a failure state or a success state. And when we return a task either, it's not gonna return those, that error or that success state directly, but it's gonna wrap, wrap it in this type, which we can then use, uh, use other functional programming um, functions which are given to us by FPTS to handle uh, this newly returned type uh, pretty seamlessly. So back to the code. Now let's look, we've looked at the return types, now let's look at the function bodies. So what I'm gonna point out here on the left is that we kind of take a promise that's returned from get reserved seats and we chain a dot then call onto this promise as I mentioned before. But the key thing is, and a key difference between functional programming and uh, promises is that that promise is created for us and we just kind of use it. It's different in functional programming because we construct that framework for a function ourselves manually because we wanna have control over what type we use. I've shown you a task either and there's many other types which I'll get to at the end of the talk. Uh, but for now we're gonna use a task either and we can think of this do function that we also import from FETS as a constructor. We're constructing this task either type, and then we're chaining stuff onto that, which we've constructed. This is probably a lot to take in so far, and there's more to come, so prepare yourselves. And there's gonna be a lot of learning in the next uh, few slides, but we're gonna go through it very slowly. So this is the same code as before, uh, but fleshed out a little bit more. And we're gonna walk through this step by step. What you can see is probably added uh, in this slide is the strings, reserve seats and reservation result. This is another difference between promise-based code and functional programming, where in promises, the data is passed down to you directly downwards. So it's the result of one dot then call is passed down to the, the, the parameter of the next dot then call, passed down one by one by one. Functional programming works slightly differently in that you can treat these as variable assignments. Uh, you can think, of this bind reserve seats as we're gonna do some computation and save it in the reserve seats variable. And then we can, uh, the task either will pass this around for us and functional programming will pass this around for us. And we can use it wherever we want, such as in the return, uh, return call at the bottom. By the way, uh, the dot binds and the dot bind L in return, these are all come from functional programming. They're not uh, the dot binds you're, you're used to. So for reserve seats, the variable assignment. What we do is we call uh, this get reserve seats method and we save it, save the result of that in the reserve seats variable. Now, I'll take a pause here and uh, give you a big tip for when you're writing functional code yourself is that always check the types match. I talked about these uh, behavior contracts and that was for a reason. We need to make sure when we're writing functional code that the functions we call and the framework we kind of pushed into uh, always match. So how do you do that? Well, in an editor like VS Code and many other editors, you can just hover over this method call and you'll see that uh, the method returns a task either. And so uh, they're matching with the same thing, both task eithers. Ignore the TE, that's just uh, an important thing. Next, we're gonna look 
at the reservation result. This is where we do the business logic. So we consume that reserve seats variable, which we uh, just saved before, and then we're doing some business logic. Again, we'll check if there's enough capacity. If not, we create this error. And then remember what I said about, we can't just return uh, data, we have to wrap it in a, in a type. So we are wrapping this error that we return in a left type uh, from uh, this call. And then uh, if there's enough capacity, we will just create the reservation and we'll check again uh, that, the that the types match and they do, um, this is a task either type, so we can just return that directly. Now let's take a look at what it looks like to consume uh, this function in the original API handler. So we have this function, and what I want to focus on uh, first is again, the function contracts. I sound like a broken record, but honestly, it's important. In this function contract on the first line, we're returning a promise. Again, like before, we haven't changed anything. I think this is really important that you can, when you're starting out with functional programming, you isolate the functional aspects of your application from the rest. So then the consuming code is none the wiser. This means that uh, first your colleagues uh, don't have to learn what functional programming is. They can just use your code as normal. And secondly, if you want, if you're experimenting uh, with functional programming, you can more easily take it away after the fact um, without having to change a lot more code. It doesn't affect the rest of your application. And so how we do this is we take this task either and we, we pass it to this function called promise from TE on the second line. Uh, and that will just convert a task either to a promise. It's really quite a simple function. Um, and we can, and this will be included in the code examples, which I'll link at the end of the presentation. So as before, we construct this task either type, and then we do some computation and we save those results in variables. So we first need to validate the request that comes in from the client. So we do this by executing some code and saving it in reservation request. What does that code look like? Well, we now have this new method called validate reservation request, which will return a task either. But the thing is, this will return just any old error. It doesn't know about uh, us wanting to return HTTP codes. So we have to change the error type. And we do this with this function called change error type, which again will be in the code examples. Uh, this comes from FPTS. And that means that if this validate reservation request fails, uh, we'll change the error type to a 422 uh, and before passing it to kind of the task either backbone, which will handle the error itself and return it to the client. And if it succeeds, we don't do anything. We just let the result pass through and be saved in the reservation request variable. Next, we consume that reservation request in uh, the next bind, where again, we pass this uh, reservation request into the try accept method as before. And then we want to change the error type because again, we don't want to return the error it gives to us. We want to change the error to be a forbidden. Um, and so that will be returned to the client. If it succeeds, we can just uh, pass it on to the return uh, call at the end. And since we don't care about the actual result of the, of the try accept or the, the reservation that's returned, we just return a 201. That's what we do in the last line. Woo, that was a lot. Um, now, I wanna say something at this point. Uh, if this didn't make sense, if, I, if we went through it pretty quickly, and which we did, uh, if this doesn't make any sense, don't worry about it at this moment. Uh, what I think you will have understood is that kind of intuitive mapping between how promises work and how functional programming code is written, and that's what matters. Uh, the code, the specific code does not matter. And what I suggest you do is, if some of this didn't make sense, I will link uh, the code examples uh, from, the, from this talk at the end of the talk, and uh, you can play around this in your own editor or on the editor I provide and kind of hover over and see the, the types and maybe change some code and see how that works and um, play around with it there and kind of get a deeper understanding for it. But for now, I think we should crack on. Um, and I mentioned that one of the benefits was refactoring. And I want to show how uh, that looks like and how the type system helps us out.
So let's imagine we're changing this try accept method from just accepting a capacity as a number to accepting a function that returns a task. Remember, we can think of a task as a promise that never fails. So what that looks like in promise-based code is uh, we have the parameter get capacity, which is a function that returns a promise. And then we consume this uh, by chaining another dot then call onto the existing promise chain. Uh, and we call this get capacity, but we, that's passed as a parameter. And then you can see the ugliness of promises where uh, we have to, have to pass this data around for us. And this is where the benefits of FP lie because, or this, this uh, do uh, construction because it passes data around for us. And what this would look like in a functional style with FPTS is this is the try accept method with the change parameter, uh, a function that returns a task. And we would pass it in uh, with a bind call and save it and try save it in this capacity variable. Now, you could think, oh, I could probably just call this function and it will work for me. Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> the type system will yell at you uh, and it'll give you this kind of cryptic error. Um, actually, it says at the, the, the first line, task is not assignable to task either. And at this point, uh, especially for writing functional code, you'll start to say, oh, is this really worth it? Am I, am I really getting anything out of this? And you'll probably look at Stack Overflow for a while. Um, and you, you might lose some hope, but please don't lose hope because the solution is really simple. Remember what I said before about us having to make sure the, the types match? Well, uh, if they don't match, there's helpers that FPTS gives us, which really makes it easy to, to convert types from one to the other. So since get capacity returns a task, and as before, I, I mentioned that a task either is just a combination of task and either, we can actually easily bring up this task uh, into a task either and make it compatible with a helper method that's given to us from FPTS. Uh, there's the import call and we just call te.fromTask. We pass it that get capacity call and it's gonna handle the, the changing of the types for us. And for consuming code, it will look and feel like a task either, but under the hood, it's actually a task. Then as before, we consume this new variable uh, in the reservation result by adding a key to the, to the parameter list and there's no other changes. Cool, so that was a, a quick refactoring and I hope I can show you, I showed you how the type system helps us there by pointing out where that behavior was incompatible. Uh, if we'd written the same code in uh, promises and say we'd passed, we'd tried to error, um, add an error handling uh, and handler for that with a dot .catch for example, the type system wouldn't have helped us out at all. Uh, we'd be essentially writing extra code um, that needs to be maintained and reasoned about when understanding that function, which doesn't benefit us at all because this get capacity uh, function can never fail. Uh, and so TypeScript helps us out because it stops us writing that extraneous code um, and tells us, hey, look, this can succeed uh, or succeed. Don't need to worry about it. There's also a benefit here that uh, if we consume some code, say from a library, it gets a lot harder to reason about what that code does uh, because you didn't write it. So you don't know if it's gonna fail or not, how they handle errors and things like this. And uh, FPTS makes it super easy because we can just see what the developer intended and the type system will help us uh, when we're writing it. But also in the future, uh, if the developer who writes a dependency changes how that code works, TypeScript will tell us, hey, look, now this thing can fail uh, with the error like before, uh, with this kind of error, and uh, we can lean on the type system to help us out here. Anyway, uh, let's look briefly um, at the other things that FP offers. I'm not gonna go through this list, but in this talk, I've already talked about tasks and task eithers, but there's lots of other uh, FP types, which I'm, which are super useful. Some of them have JavaScript equivalents, some of them don't. Uh, and this is really where the benefits of FP with correctness start to come in because you can represent uh, lots of different kinds of behaviors in your application with these types. Uh, and then your code becomes a lot more correct because as a consumer, you know exactly how these functions work. You're not just assuming. 
All right, so to close this out, uh, I want to talk about two things. Firstly, I want to talk about what you can do right now uh, and from today onwards. So you've watched this, maybe you've watched this talk uh, and you're thinking, okay, I know a bit more about FE um, and I might use it in the future. Uh, but if you're a person who watched this talk and says, great, I, I see this code and I want to write FPTS tomorrow, what can I do? Well, what I recommend to you is uh, the best scenario you could be in is that you have an upcoming project just like I did, which you could work uh, using FP4. So it could be a project that's sufficiently complicated, maybe has some database calls, uh, is asynchronous, maybe has some IO, or just things that can fail. What I suggest you do is you earmark this project to use FP4, and then you will write uh, code for this project in an isolated manner, which doesn't affect the rest of your code base using those function contracts, uh, and then you can evaluate it with that. Um, the second scenario I think that you could be in is maybe you don't have an upcoming project, but instead you um, are maintaining some code. And uh, maybe you have some code that, again, is complicated enough, can fail, has DB, DB calls, these kind of things. Uh, what you can do is start to refactor some of that code uh, into a functional style, and you'll probably start to see there's uh, places where code can error and um, fail the way you didn't expect, and you will end up improving that code just by refactoring it into FP. And lastly, I want to remind you of the big picture here. Why is FP important? And at the start, I mentioned these things with the pits of success. Today, we've only had the time to talk about the correctness pit of success. You have to take my word for it that these other pits, isolation and testability, really do help you write better code, um, especially if you're working in a TDD style, but maybe you write code first and then you test afterwards. If you write code in a functional style, you'll find that testing that code becomes super easy rather than having to refactor it after the point. If you've tried to do this, you understand uh, what I mean with testability. And again, if you are interested uh, in these bits of success, I recommend you go watch that talk by Mark Seaman, uh, Functional Architecture, Pits of Success. It really goes into this in a lot more detail. Uh, but the purpose of my talk was to give you an, ex uh, an example of real world code in TypeScript, and I hope I delivered on that promise for you, and then you now have more confidence in writing real world functional code in uh, TypeScript with FPTS. A little bit uh, about my company, I just want to mention them. I work for Imagex. Uh, what we do is we will take images from where they're stored on your server. Uh, we allow you to change them using URL parameters and then deliver them to your users as fast as possible. Um, I also personally really like the company. Uh, they're the team, uh, everyone on the team is super smart and um, also driven to, to improve the product and, and work together as a team and they're really good team players. And if you're interested, we're offering a chance to get $300 of credit um, at, this at this conference. So uh, please come to our booth and, and have a talk to us. Uh, and otherwise, um, I'll also be there if you want to come talk about this talk. Um, and yeah, that's been my talk and I hope you've enjoyed it and please enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you very much. Hey, Frederick. Thanks for that. That was amazing. Thank you so well, much. It's a well, pleasure to, to give the talk. Um, yeah, it was great. I think functional programming is one of those things that everyone is forever interested in, but is often kind of uh, a bit impenetrable or gets weirdly academic. So it's great to see Absolutely, a kind of yeah. accessible and, and real world approach to it rather than um, something a bit more up in the air. Um, so for everyone that's, that's in the chat, um, if you've got questions, uh, stick them in the Q&A panel. We'll put them to Frederick. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to say there's none at the moment, which means I can ask you my questions, which is what I was after. Go for it. I'm <laughs> um, I was curious with the, the like, TypeScript and functional programming seem to work pretty nice together. Do you think 
like strong typing and functional go hand in hand, or do you think there's some flexibility there? Um, pretty much, yeah. yeah. My, my overall answer would be yeah. Uh, since you know, when you shift from that TypeScript or types to kind of statically typed system up to a functional system, you get those. The, the main benefit is the behavior contracts. This is kind of what we're really going for. And so when you're developing, you can uh, lean on the type system to help you out. That is really the main benefit when you you code in a, a language like uh, JavaScript. Um, and so I think in, in JavaScript world, yeah, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, but there are other opportunities to uh, use functional programming without static typing. Uh, Clojure has no static types um, yeah. and still has a lot of the benefits of functional programming. Uh, and also, if you kind of want to just go for MapReduce, like the low dash lambda kind of style functional programming, which is a little bit different, that also works without TypeScript. But for this kind of specific variety, you know, uh, of, of functional programming, you need to need a, a type system for it. And it also gives you all those nice um, like ID integrations where you can you can get good suggestions. Um, you showed off some of some of the like typing support. Um, is there anything like is there anything the beneficial from uh, FPTS in terms of other dev tooling? Uh, sorry, what was the what was the first part of your question? You said so. You you mentioned that on. in VS Code you can get like uh, your type definitions when you hover over a hover over type. Um, is there any else? Any, is there any other nice like dev tooling that comes through with uh, FPTS? Uh, I for sure wouldn't say so. Um, I think. There was a part of the talk I, I kind of referenced uh, Robin's talk about validation, and this is something you can see either in my code uh, examples, which I'll post afterwards, or mm -hmm. you can go watch this talk about what that does. It's not really dev tooling; it's a it's a runtime thing. Basically, it will ensure that any data you pass to it, say in my example the the API handler, it will validate that reservation request for you to a very strict data kind of structure, yeah. um, and it does that very very seamlessly, I will say. Um, and so that's, I guess, the, one of the biggest uh, benefits. But yeah, the, the, the main one is the is the uh, IDE support and then, of course, the type system. That's cool. Uh, so we've got some questions coming in. So um, sure. any tips on solving the problem of leaving behind code that future devs might not be able to or want to refactor? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm just reading it again over on the right-hand side. Um, so I think. Uh, this kind of goes back a little bit to uh, one of my, my closing thoughts, which was, I think a, a really good candidate for functional code is code that is um, kind of prone to complexity, has lots of errors, database calls, asynchronous, this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, I think if you're kind of worried maybe about um, developers not wanting to kind of maintain that code, uh, I think you should really start with the places where it's going to have the most benefits. And then you know the, your best scenario is that they're going to, to look at it and, and go, okay, this is actually a lot cleaner than I would have to do, um, would be able to write myself in JavaScript, and then they'll kind of see the benefits of it. But if you're just writing a hello world example of functional code or something like this, they're not going to intuitively understand it. Mm -hmm. um, if you've used a library like RxJS before, which kind of does the same thing, but for reactive programming, you also kind of understand what I mean that if you write, if you have to write like a, you know, like an autocomplete or something with normal JavaScript code, that's a complete pain. And with yeah. RxJS, it just makes it obvious. And I think this is the kind of thing which, if you write it for a complex uh, area, a complex part of your, your of your of your code base, it will just make sense, and then that'll be the best chance for other devs to, to want to maintain it in the future. So this is like the hook to get them into functional. You leave behind, <laughs> leave behind some functional code in the code base. Some breadcrumbs, and some cookies, <laughs> and they come from the dark side. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. the next one, have you, have you tried other uh, FP to JS languages like ReasonML and Rescript? I haven't. Um, I not because I, I could have had a look at them. Um, but not because I don't think they're valuable, it's just because I want to maintain a high amount of compatibility with my team. Yeah. Um, and so if I were to, I think with any big decision you have to make is uh, how it's gonna work in your organization. And if I were to kind of campaign for using a, um, a language like this, uh, it's not popular, it doesn't have much support, uh, it's not very stable, 
um, uh, maybe there's some GitHub issues or something like this outstanding. And so that 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 campaign becomes quite weak. Uh, but if I can stay in, inside a language we already use and just write parts of it in a more functional style, um, it's not so hard for them to kind of get up on board there. And it actually uh, leads to a kind of better experience across the whole team, which is really what I'm going for. I'm not, you know, I don't adopt these technologies to make my life better, but to make the code read right better and my teams go better. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Kyle like alluded to this yesterday with the, the talk he gave where it's not it's not like all or nothing. You can start using some some functional approaches throughout your code. Like I imagine probably all of us are using all of the ES6 like functional bits from ES6 already yeah. without yeah. really thinking yeah. about it. And actually we can start bringing more of that in as we go. So it's not a kind of terrifying um, like jump ship straight into something else. Yeah, exactly. I think you definitely have to be quite pragmatic and um, boring, dare I say it. Dare I call functional programming boring, but it's boring enough if you do it in TypeScript that it's not going to be a big issue, hopefully. Yeah. So I think at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned um, you'd had experience with I think Haskell and F Sharp. Um, yeah, yeah, think... back, back in the day, yeah. OK, yeah. Do you think that made it easier for you to jump into this? Do you, like, do you think learning the kind of functional bits in a serious functional language was a better approach, or do you think maybe actually as a JavaScript developer, this is a nice in? I, I would say it definitely helps me. Yeah, it definitely helped me because in those languages you have no option. And also the um, because you're writing, because those languages are designed for it, you're writing less code there. So the learning curve is almost easier because you have less to understand. Like if there's just less characters on your screen, there's less there's less stuff going on that you have to understand. So that helps you learn definitely. Um, and it did help me learn uh, this library. <clears throat> but I will say that um, I don't think it's necessarily any easier. I, if you wanted to start learning functional programming uh, with strength of TypeScript, I think you could also have a, a good experience. Um, and this is really one of the reasons I created this talk was you can kind of come from it from a theoretical angle, but I think it's also really useful to have a real world practical example, which you can follow on with, say, if you watch us on YouTube again afterwards uh, and code along with it, it will start to. That's the idea of it. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, no, totally, yeah. yeah. Um, I think you've, you've, it's one of those things where like, I've put off fiddling much with TypeScript, but I'm a big, I, I love functional programming, like I played around with Perl and Haskell quite a lot and love them. And I'm now, um, Chafing the bit to jump in and play with FPCS. It feels like a good intro to both of them. And um, yeah, like two birds, one stone <laughs> type thing. Um, so, another question yeah, from uh, Essan was Is it possible to do something like yeah. Promise All with FPCS? Yeah, there's a, there's a straight um, comparison. If, if you look on uh, one of the last slides of my, um, on my talk, I had a comparison of types and JavaScript types. So, there is Two ways to do it. Um, you have kind of a straight, uh, uh, just pretty much straight uh, swap to this thing called sequence T, uh, sorry, sequence S, which will uh, complete these tasks or task either uh, simultaneously, which is what Promise all does and returns an array. There's also another um, type which works very similarly, except it executes all the tasks and tasks either simultaneously but stores the result in an object, which can be nicer depending if you want to uh, to do it that nice. way. That's really cool. But yeah, there's, there's a um, I'm curious. So I, I assume you're using this where you work. Mm -hmm. Was this what what led to this? How how did you find like yeah. bringing the rest of the team along with you with with starting this this new idea? If it's if it's the first time you've used this in your your code base. <laughs> That's yeah, a great reason. I guess talk. we can all play this talk <laughs> to people in our team to explain. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no. Fortunately, um, I did. I did uh, try on this talk recently, but um, I some what some of them had experience with uh, Haskell, not many uh, real world experience, but at least kind of theoretical experience, and so that was a big leg up. Um, otherwise, just walking through the code. So. I think it's really helpful to have someone alongside you to say, you, know, you look at this and you go, what the hell is this thing? And then you go, okay, let's break it down slowly. It looks like a promise, so it kind of works this way. 
uh, and then having someone there just to ask to answer your questions. So I just sat down with my my colleagues and said, "Hey, look, let's run through this. If you have any questions, let me know, and we can talk through it." Um, and that awesome. Kind of it sounds like all of us will be jumping on to. Uh, FPTS and dragging our teams with us, which I think is a good thing. Um, thank you so much. That was an amazing talk. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. And thanks for joining us. Um, so we're going to switch over. No, no, of course. Um, oh, yeah. Play the next talks about Dino. Uh, for anyone in the chat, um, I have a couple of exciting updates. So Auth0 uh, are running a, well, all of the speakers are running this competition. So if you go around, you can get a secret code and you'll get into a competition to win uh, some books and some t-shirts. Um, also, also running what what they've tantalizingly said to me is a login challenge, which I'm fascinated about. Uh, and you've got the chance to win a 75 pound Amazon gift card. And there's five of those, so you've got quite a good chance to win. Uh, so feel free to drop in there. Um, but maybe let's head back to the back to the other channel for the rest. Frederick, again, thank you so much for your talk, uh, and I'll speak to you later. Take care.